There's no coming to consciousness without pain. People will do anything, no matter how absurd, in order to avoid facing their own soul. One does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. My name is Lily, aka Lily Koi. I make videos about all kinds of stuff. Nutritious diet, lifestyle, emotional, spiritual well-being, and even some eating disorder recovery videos. So because of the title of this video, I want to be really clear as we start that this is absolutely not a pro eating disorder video. I did not create this video to encourage anyone who is dealing with disordered eating. Additionally, I'm going to be talking about my experiences with my eating disorders, so there's a really good chance that it could be really triggering for someone who's also either currently dealing with an eating disorder or has dealt with one in the past. So if for whatever reason you don't think you're ready or able to watch this video or if you have to leave for work in a few minutes or go to class or go make dinner for your kids, it might be best to put this video onto your watch later list and get back to it at a time when you're able to be more present with your feelings. So when I was stuck in my eating disorder and I was so frustrated with relapse after relapse after relapse and I felt like I was totally out of control of myself, it became more and more important for me to understand why I had developed these behaviors in the first place. Did I hate myself? Yes. Did I want to disappear? Yes. Did I have a subconscious belief that I wasn't worthy of nourishment? That goodness and love weren't real or trustworthy? Yes and yes. But even hearing these statements and logically, rationally knowing that they were true, it didn't necessarily help. Like, it just felt like negative stuff. It felt like I had to counteract those thoughts or beliefs with, you know, positive affirmations or just kind of lying to myself with positivity, which didn't feel real to me. And no matter how many times I tried to proceed in my recovery with those types of practices, they just didn't work. And I would always find myself relapsed again. And for years, I was totally aware that I had eating disorders. I was aware that I didn't want to have eating disorders and I thought of them as something that was purely negative, something that was a curse. There was some kind of punishment for my inherent weakness. But I kept thinking like, I can't figure this out. I can't get myself under control. There must be something deeper or more mysterious or more complicated. And I read psychology book after psychology book trying to understand how to figure out what was going on with me, looking for tools and people to help me dig, dig it up. But as I wrestled with the frustration of relapse after relapse, I finally, not because I wanted to, but because I was too exhausted to do anything else, I finally started going deeper. And what I discovered was that the driving forces behind my eating disorders, they weren't mysterious, they weren't super complicated, they weren't hard to find, because the truth is that they were with me all day, every day, in the back of my head, in the crevices of my soul, nagging at me, and all I had to do was pause. All I had to do was stop and stand still, be silent for a moment, and their screams would come rushing back to me. And pausing, you know, stopping the frantic, frenetic, constant movement that I engaged in to specifically stop myself from feeling these feelings or hearing these thoughts. Actually pausing and being with them was the most terrifying thing I have ever done. It was frightening, it was beyond uncomfortable, it was, it was just viscerally disgusting. And once I started to feel those feelings, that was when I realized that my eating disorder wasn't negative, it wasn't a curse, it wasn't because of my weakness. My eating disorders were there to save me. 
they were my coping mechanism and I don't think I would have survived without them. You know, I developed my first eating disorder when I was 13 and I was five years away from freedom. I wasn't allowed to have feelings. I was constantly crippled by anxiety and fear and I was alone in every sense of the word. And I couldn't find hope. I couldn't find any potential in myself except maybe my body. And I thought that my body had to be skinny because society told me day in and day out that skinny girls are lovable. Skinny girls are loved. And so getting my body to fit the shape that I thought was lovable and acceptable and worthy became not just a preoccupation, it became an obsession and it became a distraction. And I look back now at the landscape of my life at that time and I realize that that distraction and that obsession was a gift. Because if I was obsessed about my body and every single morsel of food that I put into it and every single calorie that was burned in the exercise that I forced it to do, then I didn't have to pay attention to the feelings that were churning around inside me. Feelings and thoughts like, I'm so alone and I'm gonna be alone forever. I'm worthless. I'm never going to be loved because I'm not lovable, because I'm a monster. I don't know how to be alive. I just don't know how to do it. But all of these really heavy thoughts that a 13 year old just isn't equipped to handle, especially not a 13 year old who's not allowed to have feelings, let alone those feelings. And so, all of those thoughts and all of those feelings could be totally eclipsed by hunger and the hope that once my body was a certain shape or size or weight that everything would be different. But then I was skinny and my body was that shape and it was that weight and I wore the right size jeans and nothing changed. I was still five years from freedom alone in every sense of the word and crippled by anxiety and fear every moment of my life. And that's when the binges started. You know, yes, I was starved. My body was starved. My brain needed calories. I needed nutrients. And so my body demanded food and my mind demanded a scapegoat because God help me, I was skinny. I was the right size and nothing had changed, my hope was threatened. And so my amazing little primate brain gave me a scapegoat and I started binging. And it was amazing how quickly a binge could take my problems from shapeless and undefinable and terrifying to a simple problem of, Lily, you feel this way and this is happening to you and everything in your life is a horrible mess because you binged. And I would sit there and I would convince myself that all I had to do was be a lovable, acceptable, not horribly lonesome human being was just not binge. That's all I had to do, just don't binge. And I clung to that idea for years. And it was that hope of being able to solve all of my problems just through a simple choice of not binging, of not having an eating disorder that got me through the rest of my teenage years. I mean, it barely got me through, but I don't think I would have survived without that. You know, looking back, I know how subconsciously terrified I was that if I did get the eating disorders under control, and if I did kind of sort out that part of my life, and if I did get my body to a size and a shape that I wanted it to be, I knew deep down that that wasn't the real reason that my life didn't look like I wanted to. And so the only thing that was scarier than having an eating disorder for the rest of my life was not having an eating disorder for the rest of my life and coming to the realization that it wasn't the eating disorder that was the problem, it was me. But of course, you know, I had this deep inner knowing that the simplicity of all of my problems being because of my eating disorder was false. And knowing that and the anxiety that it created kept me binging, then purging, 
on and on and on. But I mean, the distraction saved my life. And at the same time, my eating disorders could have killed me. You know, I remember feeling so weak. I remember getting sicker and sicker. I remember feeling the heart palpitations when I would be laying on the floor of my apartment after puking my guts out and just feeling my heart flutter around in the most random ways. And I remember thinking, good, you know, finally. Maybe my heart will just give up on me like the rest of me has because I don't have anything left. And that was what my eating disorder did. It weakened me and it broke me down to the point where I, I had no energy left to run. I had no energy left to try to ignore or silence the parts of me that were screaming, <laughs> parts of me that were constantly saying, you're unlovable, you're unworthy, you're never gonna be happy, no one is ever gonna want you. What if you die alone, you failure? And when I was so physically and emotionally just wrecked and weakened, it felt like I was floating in the ocean. It felt like the fear and the anxiety and the depression and the anger and the grief and the regret and just the deep sadness. It felt like that was the water and that I was treading water as hard as I could to try to keep my head above all of that. But I got to the point where I couldn't anymore. I was too tired. And so I stopped and I went under the water and I was swamped by anxiety and fear and grief and sadness and just the deepest, blackest depression and so much anger, so much anger. And I thought it was gonna drown me and it almost did. And I know for a fact that if I had tried to face those feelings with no support, with no solid family connections, with no ability to choose how I took care of myself, it would have killed me. And so it was my use of my eating disorder to ignore those feelings and to keep myself from being swamped that got me through the years when I had no control over my own life. My eating disorders gave me focus. They gave me a tangible problem. They gave me a tangible, albeit fake, reason why my life sucked and why I sucked. And as backwards as it sounds, I wouldn't have survived without them. I wouldn't have made it to my early and mid 20s when I was able to ask for help, when I was able to admit that I had feelings like anger, like fear, like resentment, like loneliness. So while I have no nostalgia and no desire to return to a disordered way of eating, and while I'm really grateful that the last six years has been free from that kind of behavior and free from any feelings of needing that kind of behavior to get me through life. I do understand why. I understand why my eating disorders were there. I understand the purpose that they served. I get it. I had to cope. The anorexia, the bulimia, the binge eating disorder, they served a purpose. And even though for so long that I thought the anorexia, the bulimia, the binging, I thought those were my demons, those were not my demons. They were keeping me distracted from facing my demons. So while I don't think I'm grateful for my eating disorders, I definitely get it. I get while they were there and I needed them. And I am so grateful that I don't need them anymore. I don't, you know, I'm not scared of the feelings that I was running from for so long. As it turns out, they're hard, but they're not that scary. I kind of feel like anxiety and depression and grief and anger and fear, they're kind of like pet spiders, you know? It's like every time you see them or they enter your life, you're like, oh God. But then you're like, oh, it's just George. It's just George. Okay. Since we started with a quote from Carl Jung, I will end with another one of my favorite quotes from him. He says, I am not what has happened to me. 
I am what I choose to become. Simple little one-liner, not so simple, huh? <laughs> All right, you guys. I feel awkward saying thank you for watching because I am deeply sorry if you are in the position of needing to watch this video. I know what that means for you and your precious soul. I've been there, right? Okay. Well, as always, make better choices for yourself. No one's going to do it for you. And take really, really good care. I will see you all very soon. Bye.